this is a new threat intelligence talk, really focused on threat intelligence. We're calling this TAQ test two, which is a callback to uh, the first talk I ever did here at CTI Summit, which was called TIQ test, and it was really a pun on IQ test, right? Let's see how intelligent your threat intelligence really is. And um, this is pretty much me a revisitation of those concepts, but in a way more practical and focused uh, uh, direction, right? So I think we only improve by trying, and uh, God knows I've tried a lot to make sense of the data that we ingest. And uh, these are the things that are working for me now. Maybe in a couple of years, they will accept me again, <laughs> fools, and I will uh, have a new version, hopefully. So anyway, who's this guy, right? So I am, first and foremost, a Brazilian immigrant here in the US and a capybara enthusiast, right? If you can tell by my shirt, right? And um, I've been working, I was a founder at this company called Nido, and we built, uh, and I know, I think everybody's gonna hit their bingo right now, but it's uh, an autonomous threat hunting system, right? And the idea is that we were using threat intelligence and behavioral analytics like things to try to automate as much as we could, and I can see Rob Lee cringing somewhere, uh, the threat intelligence practice, right? And uh, we're not part of Verizon, this is not what this talk is about, we're continuing doing the same thing, the same product, so if you're curious about that, just let me know later. So anyway, what's to expect? Uh, also, before we start, I am famously known for going over time on my talks, and this clock is not ticking, right? So it's not my fault this time. Right? I was gonna be, I'm gonna watch the clock. Thank you, thank you so much. Anyway, what should we expect for this talk, right? At the very least, we'll have one fair warning, a witty metaphor, I hope it lands. We have three novel-ish ideas. It's, it's a kind of a rehash. Some of them are a rehash on the original uh, TIQ test, but some of them are hopefully novel. Uh, hopeful dreams, right? Why can't we think about what's the research gonna be like in a few years, right? A lot of self-serving callbacks, I have warned you, right? I'm gonna be talking about some of my previous research as well. And at least one capybara, right? So that's a promise, right? That first, that one, oh, the back's not really. That one, that was one, right? But there might be another one going forward. So anyway, I'm not breaking any uh, campaigns, I'm not uh, talking about this huge criminal organization. I'm not talking about trade graph. I'm here as an accountant, right? I'm just trying to tally up kind of the, the data sets that we have, tally up the, the, the threat intelligence that we try to consume in every day and try to make some use of it, right? That's kind of my life's work and uh, specifically because um, uh, the research that I have worked in dabbles a lot in machine learning it necessarily dabbles a lot in data quality, right? This is the most import, important thing. Every hour you spend in data quality and making sure that the ground truth that you have and you're training your models in, it's 100 times more valuable, 1,000 times more valuable than an hour you spend tweaking the algorithm or, or something like that. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about this, and uh, this is a kind of a, I mean, this is what data science do, I guess, right? I, I always keep telling accountant friends that they should just call themselves money scientists, right? They'll be much more popular because we're kind of doing the same thing, right? So anyway, I, I believe that only by facing this kind of thing and trying to have metrics around uh, how well we're doing, we're actually gonna be able to industrialize this, right? Because we're all working very hard here Right? And I have no doubt that the brightest minds in threat intelligence generation are here in this room. But if we cannot get this reliably to the te teams who are defending, right, and in a way that they don't have to do a lot of work in order to combat false positives and things like that, we're not really doing our job, right? The bottom line is defense, right? So how, and I, Lincoln was, somebody read my report. We should be super proud. That somebody used my IOC in order to catch someone, right? So this is what we want to. But anyway, this is about metrics, right? But, so specifically metrics on what? So I'm gonna be talking specifically about one thing that I know a lot of people on Unsense are very, very passionate about, right? 
And uh, it's one of the things that brings the SANS community together, right? And I've heard it's, it's something that everyone believes so strongly, right? You could always be, uh, I mean, it's a kind of a, it always has a pejorative context, but it's, it's a kind of a cult. I'm obviously talking about orange theory, right? So for you, <laughs> you folks who are not uh, aware of, of what orange theory is, it's basically, um, maybe a metrics-driven CrossFit? I don't know, it's all about the gains, I'm told, right? And um, the idea is that you're exercising and there's this huge board and it's really accounting how much percentage of your heart rate is at because if you're above a specific percentage, it's magic, right? And you never have to exercise again. It's something along those lines, okay? I, I might be misquoting a little bit. I'm not an expert on this specific part of the talk, right? So anyway, it's January, right? So New Year resolution, my wife manages to drag me to an Orange Theory class, right? And I'm like, okay, sure, it's gonna be a disaster, right? I'm gonna be, what's gonna happen, right? It's, it's terrible. So to my surprise, not only I seem to do a good job, I'm actually the best one in the class, right? I'm the one that burns the most calories, I'm the one who has the most splat points. I know, <laughs> I didn't come up with the name, I'm sorry. But the, but the idea of the splat point was that I was exercising above the specific level, right? And so it was a good exercise. And if I got enough of those, there would be long-term benefits and uh, uh, things like that. And I'm like, huh, that's funny. I'm not usually, I shouldn't have been the best, right? I mean, I'm so unfit, why, why would I be the best, right? And then I realized, oh, this is gonna get harder. So, the fitter I am, the more effort I'm gonna have to put in order to get the same result, right? And it's actually an interesting twist because it really incentivizes people to start, right? And I started thinking about this, right? What if orange theory is what I'm consuming in a way? It's a set of exercises, it's a set of things, right, that I have to do, right, in order to achieve a specific goal, right? And that, combined with my telemetry, right, what results I'm getting of it, what kind of, of I don't know, I was gonna put the thing, but I forgot. I was gonna put the, the heart rate monitor, but anyway. What if combined with that, I have some first order utility here, so I can measure what happened when I apply this specific set of instructions, specific set of things into my telemetry, right? So this is like the, the easiest thing to measure, right? Would be, for instance, the calories that I burn, but then there's some second order benefits here right, which is the really, the thing I should be really searching for, right? And, hmm, okay, I wonder if I can make a parallel to something where as you get more mature, right, and as you're trying for more sources, right, it actually makes it a lot harder for you to find the way, what is the optimal mix or what's the optimal uh, things that we should be doing, right? So anyway, it's all about Good measurement, especially as your input is transforming your maturity, has to make sure that you're taking diminishing, diminishing returns into account, right? What I'm telling you is that after your first million IOCs, the second million IOCs are probably not gonna make you any better, right? Probably not. That's not the metric you should be chasing. That's not what it's all about, but how do you understand better what first and second order utility you might get from your ingestion strategy might help you to be a little bit more prepared going forward. So anyway, way, way 50 years ago, I don't remember anymore, um, I had the idea of uh, the TIQ, right? And it was really about measuring uh, some things you could get from threat intelligence feeds, right? So uh, there were five tests, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but they are organized like that on purpose, right? So the first two were pretty much about, oh, is this feed even alive, right? 
Are they taking old indicators out? Are they adding new IOCs in? And to be quite frank with you, this is like inside baseball, right? This is really not interesting for anyone unless you are a threat intelligence generator and you wanna say, oh yeah, I, I'm more agile than, than, than the other folks or something like that, right? So there's interest, but there's not really a lot going on there, right? Then there was the overlap and the uniqueness, which was really got people very excited because they could start to see, oh yeah, so this feed actually has the same kind of stuff as that feed, right? Which is helpful, right? You, you, you're trying to, maybe you have a, a pipeline that is not so complete, right? Or maybe not so stable, and you wanna make sure you're ingesting, you can only have like 500,000 per day, and you wanna make sure you're, you're getting the right 500,000. But this gives you insight on your, what you're consuming, right? But still I think they were too, much, too complicated for what they were meant to be. They didn't really have to be that specific for it to be useful for a team that's, that's defending, right? And finally, we had population, which was the odd one out, uh, in the sense that it tried to find a relationship between the data you're generating, right, like your telemetry, and the, the actual data on the threat intelligence, which is kind of the first order utility, and it's cropped here, but at least it's not cropped there, right? So it's, it's, we're gonna revisit that, but it's gonna be, again, simpler, right? So anyway, if you're really super curious, you should, you should look into those. They're not gonna really matter. Whatever, whatever we need from them, we'll, we're gonna go through on this specific thing. So what I wanna introduce first is the coverage test, right? And really the coverage test, right, and it's a, it's, it's a kind of a, an evolution of the overlap concept is, are you getting the data you need from the feeds you consume, right? And the idea is really, are you just ingesting the same thing over and over and over again, right? And um, by understanding how much unique data each feed has, and that's really the only thing you need to know while you're ingesting them, right? You know what opportunities to improve your detection, right, actually are from the data that you have collected, right? So the, this was the overlap uh, test, right? And again, this is too much inside base. I don't really need to know that uh, what I had on OTX was 60, was 55% of what I had on VX Vault, right? And most of these names are, are, are open threat intelligence feeds that you, you probably heard about. Specifically, OTX was, at the time this, this, this thing was calculated, we were using it a lot for our homegrown threat intelligence. So, I mean, it's interesting, it's, it's curious, right? If you're really going deep into comparing a bunch of different feeds against each other, right? This is useful, but it's still inside baseball. What we need is something way, way simpler, right? I was advised against putting those kinds of slides, but I'm sorry, you, you accepted my talk, you're gonna have to <laughs> suffer through it. <laughs> this is very simple, guys, deep reps, right? The only thing I'm doing in this coverage test is seeing what is the difference? What, what do you have on the feed? What would you, ha what you have on a specific feed that you don't have on all the others that you have? What is unique on a feed? That's the coverage. How much indicators I have on this feed that I don't have on any other feed? And the percentage of coverage is how does that look against how many things I have on the feed? So let's say I have a feed with 10 IPs and those are unique. Sorry, I have a feed of 100 IPs, right? But only 10 of those are not on any other feed. So this will have a 10 of coverage and will have a 10% of coverage percentage, right? So this is the kind of thing that you would expect. And uh, I appreciate it's very teeny tiny, but uh, let me see if I can speak here to help. But specifically, it's giving you an idea of how much independent data you're getting from each feed. Right? So specifically there, I told you that OTX was one that was a lot of our homegrown stuff. We weren't really seeing it anywhere else, right? Open fish is usually very fresh, right? It's, it's the campaigns that are ongoing. It's not usually on more established threat intelligence feeds. But then you can start to see, oh, okay. So this is kind of the utility I'm getting for each one of them. This is what I have to play with, right? And um, even if, if you have a pipeline issue, or maybe if you're paying for something that's not 
uh, you're not seeing this, uh, this specific breadth of, uh, of uniqueness, right? Maybe you shouldn't be ingesting, you shouldn't play with them, right? And conversely, you have the percentage, right? Which, I mean, gives you a, a better perspective on scale invariance, right? It doesn't matter if a feed, if a feed has a million things and only one, or only a hundred are unique, right? You're always, you're specifically looking at, um, it's, it's way worse than someone that has a hundred that, that is unique, right? And this is also very handy, right? Because when a vendor comes to you and he's like, uh, please, here's, I, I'd like a half a million dollars from you to, for you to have my feed. You can just show them, oh, actually, only 25% of your thing is new, so I would like a 75% discount, please, right? It doesn't usually work, but, well, it's, it's worth a try, right? So, we, also, we have to be cautious with our interpretation, right? This is just a numeric number for something that is way it's usually way fuzzier, right? So if something is too unique, <laughs> it's potentially a lot wrong, right? So y y it, this is also helps you understand if a feed makes sense on the context uh, of what you're doing, right? So it's important to see if these folks specialize in something or other thing, right? It might reflect on those uniqueness numbers, right? And also, you don't need, really have to cut the, the feeds that you, you, you have uh, duplicates, right? So it's not uncommon that people will, well, if I have two matches on two different feeds while I'm doing the analysis, you know what, I'll just bypass the, the cert team, I'll directly open a ticket for, for handling because I have enough confidence because it wasn't on two or three completely separate things, right? And uh, this should be good. I mean, I don't believe those pe all those people would do the same mistake. It happens, but especially when it's like active response and everybody's trying to figure out what's going on, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. But anyway, this has nothing to do with generation coverage, right? I'm not tracking an actor and seeing, oh, do I know all the campaigns those, this actor is doing, right? So there was a talk, I think, on a previous um, CTI summit from Aaron Schemeyer specifically about that, right? How do you, how do you make sure your le expected levels of, I should be seeing this amount of Loki or this amount of 3DAX because I know they're all the same group, but they keep switching, so I know that I, they must be getting their money from somewhere, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm tracking them. So this has nothing to do with that. That's, a, that's really a, a generation problem, which we're not talking about here. But anyway, this is what I, I mean by, by coverage. So talking about what we have to work with, right, then we go into the fit, right, is really how much does this thing matches what I have, right? And again, I had this population test, right? And I e even had a slide of the population test, and I was, again, advised against not showing you the, the, the slide of the population test, but that advice I took, because it's really preposterous, right? It's, really like, it's way too clever for its own good. It doesn't really serve any real purpose as far as telling you about the feed, Although I believe that, and, and this is a part of the, of the calculations that we do in, in the models, we, in the feature sets of the models that we have worked with, uh, talk about how different is this bad traffic from your normal traffic. This is part of the equation. It's very, it's interesting for detection. If you're expecting a place to be more evil than other places, when you're trying to make an informed decision if you should investigate something or not, right? But the point, again, going back to the million, uh, to the millions and millions of, uh, of IOCs, right? If you don't see those IOCs on your telemetry, they're just, they're just wasting space, right? They're, you're not really using their detection power for anything, right? So, again, very simple, right? The idea is, I'm trying to find, for each one of the feeds that I have, what is the intersection between the feed and the stuff that I have visited, right? And uh, before anybody throws a fit on the, the one, the <laughs> this specific part is, the, is really the, what we were doing before on the coverage test, right? So the unique fitness would be how much of the unique stuff that I have on each feed then becomes relevant for my telemetry, right? So every time a threat intelligence feed hits your telemetry, it's hopefully 
a chance for you to detect something bad, right? That's assuming that the feed is correct, and that's a huge, huge assumption, I know, right? But uh, the parallel I'm trying to do here, this is pretty much how much calories you're gonna spend out of the specific feed. The rest, the rest is just like, you know, you're just drinking water, you're eating, I don't know, lettuce, it's not really counting for anything. I know that that's not real. I know that counts for a lot, but bear with me. So this is an example of unique fit, right? And again, I have the OTX that was very unique on that specific group, showing up as a very, very high bar. But still, it's matching a lot on a specific group of telemetry that I, ha that I have selected, right? More usually than not, if you have a huge fit, right, in an environment that you don't expect to be very noisy, right, it means you have a few false positives there, right? So uh, the second one is actually uh, uh, Bumbanek's feed. So I'm not sure, some of you might be familiar with John Bumbanek. He, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Um, he works at Fidelis and he has a very good uh, open source feed for DGA, right? And he does an excellent job, excellent job on cleaning the DGA feed, but once every, I don't know, few times, a uh, parking IP address sneaks through, right? So someone registered the domain, but it, it fell on a parking, and uh, you'll have people accessing parking IP addresses left, right, and center. So you'll also see a lot of, you would see a lot of matches, again, if you know the lineage. So when I see investigate the outliers is, are those matches expected at, at this high, is this high number of matches expected from what I'm seeing on this feed, right? From what I understand where the feed is, right? And can I keep them in control, right? As far as my detection pipeline is concerned, because I, I can now predict or I can now at least try to, to understand better what are the kinds of false positives that these feeds might uh, generate. And I understand there's a lot, this is a lot of things that's not on that number over there, right? But the number told me as a part of the investigation of what is this feed and what potential impact this feed can have on my telemetry, it gave me a prompt of, okay, now I need to do some work on this feed to understand what's the best possible way for me to do it, right? But it just gives you clarity. It gives you something to look at and also a trend to follow, right? If one of those feeds vary too much, right, they might have lost their sources and methods. I've seen this happen a, long, a, lo a lot of times. It was so fun when, like, Neckers just went dark. A lot of people that had such great intel about uh, uh, cybercrime activities, they're just like, oh, yeah, uh, we're not quite sure what's going on. We should be getting emails, right? And uh, Emotet is on vacation, apparently, right? Uh, nobody has seen them since, I don't know, January 10th or something. So you can start to be, be prepared and, 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 and understand those variations, right? And if those variations have impact on your detection or your collection requirements. So anyway, most important thing, a bad fit does not mean a bad feed, right? It just not be for you, right? If, if I get a little bit of, uh, of Rob Lee's beard, you know, and I sprinkle it on the telemetry, it might not hit uh, on the telemetry of a small credit union, right? And, uh, and that's fine. I'm sure it, it, it will be great on, a, on an ICS environment, right? But you gotta be, it also helps you, of course, make sure it, whatever you're getting is tailored for your, for your specific need, right? And again, this doesn't, <laughs> nothing here solves false positives, I'm sorry, if that's what you were expecting. Um, but <laughs> the, the idea is, again, giving you clarity and making sure you, you have a number to follow and to understand what's going on. What I think it's, it's very positive, I mean, if you, we just didn't have a talk where no one ever in this room is gonna share any indicators ever again, I think it's interesting, uh, the fact that having a fit of, uh, of the IOCs with the telemetries of the members of a sharing community helps answer the, am I the only one seeing this question, right? Which is, honestly, I think it's the most, the question people want the most answered out of a sharing community like this. Are they targeting me or is anyone else seeing all of this, right? 
I'm not even going to go into that bucket of wasps because I already have a whole talk about sharing communities and that was not, there, there was some disagreement around that one. Anyway, where do we want to get? We want to get into impact, right? We want to get those splat points, right? So really the idea is how much detection are we getting out of this, right? And this should be our gold standard, right? And uh, you see, I'm very, <laughs> My function good alerts is, the, is really the, the, the million dollar function, right? What is a good alert right there, right? But, uh, but really the idea here, what I'm trying to convey as a good alert as far as threat intelligence is concerned, right, is an alert that is correct, right? Even though it has been alerted by something. What's wrong, Rob? I see you're, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm just nervous. He's, he's walking a lot there. Okay, that's fair. So my idea here is, if you detected this using your threat intelligence, oh, but my Faro also found it, that the, it was a good alert. It wasn't a false positive, right? I'm talking about utility that you're getting from this specific detection control, right? And, uh, and this is really where the, the thing shines, I believe, right? And I, I, I put those squares there just for us to be able to track those between specifically the analysis as the, the impact as a whole, right? So we're talking here that 80-ish uh, percent of, the, of, a, of a BCH uh, ransomware tracker, well, they were good. They generated alerts that were good, right? They were verified by the team and they loved it, right? And we had a similar number for, for VX, uh, VX Vault, which is a, uh, I mean, the folks in Europe that maintain this list, it's very, it's kept very up to date with, the, with malware from several different denominations, right? But when you combine that with unique impact, and that's interesting, right? Almost everyone has the ransomware data or had the ransomware data when this thing was analyzed, right? And uh, it was really the peak of ransomware, and everybody was, everybody and their dog had one, uh, that this specific analysis was, was made. But you see, VX Vault became, still stayed very high on the detection level, uh, unique detection level. And that, what I mean by that is that there were things that were only on VX Vault. If I hadn't had that fee there, they, this, uh, the, the specific detection mechanism wouldn't have been triggered, right? I still think that's not enough, right? And uh, I'm still only talking about direct matches, right? I'm still only talking, I found this IP address, I found this domain on a feed, right? But what if we learn from it, right? And everybody here, a lot of folks here, Keith was one who was talking about it, about climbing the pyramid, right? Is if I have IP addresses and domains, can I learn a higher order of detection from that and then ex expand? expand from it, and I have a simple example here where I had three domains which were USA.cc pointed to an IP address, but then my detection was this max security USA.cc, right? So should I give malware domains and this needle source uh, um, threat intelligence a credit for that detection as well? How do I account that? It's probably not the same credit as that one, should I take into consideration how the, the way I looked at these data points and how they were related on, on who is, on, on, on those things? So it's a very complicated question to answer with the amount of math that I'm allowed to show here on this stage. But the idea is that you should also be able to understand what of your detection power is coming from the learning, or from the your team working on the threat intelligence that they know and then expanding on that knowledge to find specific things. And again, this is not achievable for everyone. You actually have to have a team which is either actively threat hunting or actively working, messaging those IOCs to generate this added value, so to speak. But anyway, anyone can dream. So what about the future, right? Let's, let's use some, let's use some some predictions here. Here are the things that I would like to do, right? We got as far as how much, how, mu how many times I was above 84%, right? What would I really like to do? 
I would really like to talk about benefit, right? What's the benefit of this feed, right? And so the idea is, if I could use this feed correctly or this combination of feeds, I assure you you'll have at least 10 actionable alerts per week, right? This is a huge, huge thing to say. Because not only you have to understand that an alert was generated, but actually what was the, the, the process on the IR team, right, to handle it, and what was the outcome from the IR team, right, in order to do that. And this is an end-to-end -end that I was gonna say I haven't seen many people do that. I haven't seen anyone that does that effectively, that actually is able to feed that data back. And if we go even further, we could start talking about assurance, right? Which is, well, we are so much in control of the, the intelligence that we're generating, we know we can find those folks within 24 or 48 hours, right? Even if they switch their infrastructure, we know how they usually switch, or we know what is within their operational parameters of velocity, right? So we would be able to find them again fairly quickly, right? This is something that I'm not sure if, if, if it's even possible, right? And uh, unless we're actively working to tie back breaches and, uh, and, uh, and handle incidents back to the detection path, so this was a whole talk about lineage in a way, right? I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to account for, for each detection that I did, who was responsible for it, which feed, what happened, right? And um, if we can follow this thread up until the actual resolution of the incident, right, you would have a much better understanding of how much a feed or any detective control, really, this is not, so not necessarily a talk about threat intelligence, uh, was able to generate for us. And I'd love to go somewhere and say, okay, if you do this four times a week, we're gonna keep you uh, below to 200 pounds and you're gonna be fine, up, at least until you're 45. I'd love to do that, but nobody, nobody, nobody wants to sell me that. I actually have to work for it, it's terrible. Anyway, my point is, it's not easy, right? You just can't buy a feed and hope that everything's gonna turn out right. You actually have to work for it, right? So to avoid diminishing returns, you must continually be understanding what the mix is and how you put those things to work, right? And uh, if you don't understand how those things are, are fueling your detection pipeline, right, you're gonna get this detection plateau, right? And I'm not sure if I'm talking to the people who actually exercise. I'm trying very hard to push this analogy. Uh, and um, you're just getting more feeds and you're not getting any more secure or more fit or more mature. Anyway, Rob. <laughs> All right, clap for him, everybody. All right, thanks, Dan.